The Battle of Pharsalus was a decisive battle of Caesar's civil war. On 9 August 48 BC at Pharsalus in central Greece, Gaius Julius Caesar and his allies formed up opposite the army of the Republic under the command of Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus. Pompey had the backing of a majority of the senators, of whom many were optimates, and his army significantly outnumbered the veteran Caesarian legions. The two armies confronted each other over several months of uncertainty, Caesar being in a much weaker position than Pompey. The former found himself isolated in a hostile country with only 22,000 men and short of provisions, while on the other side of the river he was faced by Pompey with an army about twice his large in number. Pompey wanted to delay, knowing the enemy would eventually surrender from hunger and exhaustion. Pressured by the senators present and by his officers, he reluctantly engaged in battle and suffered an overwhelming defeat ultimately fleeing the camp and his men, disguised as an ordinary citizen. Prelude A dispute between Caesar and the Optimates faction in the Senate of Rome culminated in Caesar marching his army on Rome and forcing Pompey, accompanied by much of the Roman Senate, to flee from Italy to Greece in 49 BC where he could better conscript an army to face his former ally, Caesar, lacking a fleet to immediately give chase solidified his control over the western Mediterranean, Spain specifically, before assembling ships to follow Pompey. Marcus Calpornius Bibulus, whom Pompey had appointed to command his 600-ship fleet, set up a massive blockade to prevent Caesar from crossing to Greece and to prevent any aid to Italy. Caesar, defying convention, chose to cross the Adriatic during the winter, with only half his fleet at a time. This move surprised Bibulus and the first wave of ships managed to run the blockade easily. Now prepared, Bibulus managed to prevent any further ships from crossing, but died soon afterwards. Caesar was now in a precarious position, holding a beachhead at Epirus with only half his army, no ability to supply his troops by sea, and limited local support, as the Greek cities were mostly loyal to Pompey. Caesar's only choice was to fortify his position, forage what supplies he could, and wait on his remaining army to attempt another crossing. Pompey by now had a massive international army, however, his troops were mostly untested raw recruits, while Caesar's troops were hardened veterans. Caesar began to despair and used every channel he could think of to pursue peace with Pompey. When this was rebuffed he made an attempt to cross back to Italy to collect his missing troops but was turned back by a storm. Finally, Mark Antony rallied the remaining forces in Italy, fought through the blockade and made the crossing, reinforcing Caesar's forces in both men and spirit. Now at full strength Caesar felt confident to take the fight to Pompey. Pompey was camped in a strong position just south of Dyrrhachium with the sea to his back and surrounded by hills, making a direct assault impossible. Caesar ordered a wall to be built around Pompey's position in order to cut off water and pasture land for his horses. Pompey built a parallel wall and in between a kind of no man's land was created, with fighting comparable to the trench warfare of World War I. Finally the standoff was broken by a traitor in Caesar's army, who informed Pompey of a weakness in Caesar's wall. Pompey immediately exploited this information and forced Caesar's army into a full retreat, but ordered his army not to pursue, fearing Caesar's reputation for setting elaborate traps. This caused Caesar to remark, Today the victory had been the enemy's. Had there been any one among them to gain it, Pompey continued his strategy of mirroring Caesar's forces and avoiding any direct engagements. After trapping Caesar in Thessaly, the prominent senators in Pompey's camp began to argue loudly for a more decisive victory. Although Pompey was strongly against it, he wanted to surround and starve Caesar's army instead, he eventually gave it an accepted battle from Caesar, on a field near Pharsalus. Date and location 
The date of the actual decisive battle is given as the 9th of August 48 BC according to the Republican calendar. According to the Julian calendar, however, the date was either the 29th of June or possibly the 7th of June. As Pompey was assassinated on 3 September 48 BC, the battle must have taken place in the true month of August, when the harvest was becoming ripe. The location of the battlefield was long a subject of controversy among scholars. Caesar himself, in his commentary Idabello Civili, mentions few place names, and although the battle is called after Pharsalos, Four ancient writers, the author of the Bellum Alexandrinum, Frontinus, Eutropius, and Orosius, place it specifically at Palifarsalos. Strabo in his Geographica mentions both old and new Pharsaloi, and notes that the Tidion, the temple to Thetis south of Scotosa, was near both. In 198 BC in the Second Macedonian War Philip V of Macedon sacked Pali Pharsalos, but left New Pharsalos untouched. These two details perhaps imply that the two cities were not close neighbours. Until the early 20th century, unsure of the site of Pali Pharsalos, scholars followed Apain and located the Battle of 48 BC south of the Enipeus or close to Pharsalos. The North Bank thesis of F. L. Lucas based on his 1921 solo field trip to Thessaly is now, however, broadly accepted by historians. A visit to the ground has only confirmed me, Lucas wrote in 1921, and it was interesting to find that Mr. Apostolidis, son of the large local landowner, the hospitality of whose farm at Tech S. I enjoyed was convinced too that the battle site was by Driscoll, now Creaney, for the very sound reason that neither the hills nor the river further east suit Caesar's description, John D. Morgan in his definitive Pali Pharsalus, the battle and the town, arguing for a site closer still to Creaney, where he places Pali Pharsalus, writes, my reconstruction is similar to Lucas's, and in fact I borrow one of his alternatives for the line of the Pompeian retreat. Lucas's theory has been subjected to many criticisms, but has remained essentially unshaken. The opposing armies. The Caesarian army Caesar had the following legions with him. Legions of veterans from the Gallic Wars, Caesar's favorite legion, ex Equestris, and those later known with the names of 8 Augusta, I ex Hispana, and 12 Fulminata. Legions levied for the Civil War, legions later known as I Germanica, 3 Gallica, and V Macedonica. However, all of these legions were under strength. Some only had about a thousand men at the time of Pharsalus. Due partly to losses at Dyrrhachium and partly to Caesar's wish to rapidly advance with a picked body as opposed to a ponderous movement with a large army. According to his accounts, he had 80 cohorts on the battlefield, about 22,000 men. The Pompeian army in total, Caesar counted 110 complete cohorts in the Pompeian army, 11 legions consisting of about 45,000 men, although Orosius. Following Libyan Pollio, only counted 88 cohorts, and Hans Delbruck suggests that Caesar's count includes detachments at Dyrrhachium and elsewhere, leaving only 88 cohorts in the Pompeian army. Battle. Deployment Pompey had every tactical advantage an army could hope for, he held the higher ground, had superiority of numbers, and was better supplied from his many allies in Greece. This caused him to act conservatively. Pompey deployed his army in the traditional formation of three lines with a depth of ten men. Again according to convention he posted his most experienced legions on the flanks, dispersing his new recruits along the center. Pompey's right was protected by the river Enipeus, therefore he massed all his cavalry on Caesar's right. He had given command of the cavalry to Labianus, the former commander of Caesar's favorite ex-legion. He deployed the rest of the army on his left together with his auxiliary troops. Pompey's plan was to allow Caesar's infantry to advance, have his cavalry attack and push back the numerically inferior Julian horses, and then attack Caesar's infantry from behind. 
Caesar knew this would be his last stand as his army had run out of supplies, and with no lines of retreat they would be at Pompey's mercy and likely to be slaughtered if they lost the battle. This nothing-to-lose mentality was played up by Caesar to his men as he explained that defeat meant nothing less than death. Caesar also deployed in three lines but could only set them to six men deep if he was to match the length of Pompey's line. Like Pompey he was protected by the river on his left allowing him to position all his cavalry to the right as a counter. As was typical of Caesar he gambled and began discreetly thinning his already depleted ranks of men then repositioned them as a fourth line to support his cavalry against the inevitable assault by the much larger Pompeian cavalry. Caesar himself commanded the cavalry, he posted the renowned 10th legion on his right under Sulla, with the undermanned 8th and possibly the 9th on his left under Mark Antony. In the center he designated Domitius as the commanding officer. Progress of the battle There was significant distance between the two armies, according to Caesar. Pompey ordered his men not to charge but to wait until Caesar's legions came into close quarters. Pompey's advisor Caius Triarius believed that Caesar's infantry would be fatigued and fall into disorder if they were forced to cover twice the expected distance. But seeing that Pompey's army was not advancing, Caesar's men, without orders, stopped to rest and regroup before continuing the charge. Caesar, in his history of the war, would praise his own men's discipline and experience, and question Pompey's decision not to charge. The heavy infantry then engaged. Pompey's legions could take the attack due to their deep formations. Labianus then ordered the Pompeian cavalry to attack, as expected they successfully pushed back Caesar's cavalry until his hidden fourth line joined, in, using their peeler to thrust at Pompey's cavalry and turn them to flight. After this, Caesar threw in his last line of reserves, a move which at this point meant that the battle was more or less decided. Pompey could see this, after observing his cavalry routed, Pompey retreated to his camp and left his troops to their own devices, ordering the garrison to defend camp as he gathered his family, loaded up gold, and threw off his general's cloak and fled. Caesar urged his men to end the day by capturing the enemy camp. They complied with his wishes, furiously attacking the walls. The Thracians and the other auxiliaries who were left in the camp, in total seven cohorts, defended bravely, but were not able to fend off the assault. Caesar had won his greatest victory, claiming to have only lost about 200 soldiers and 30 centurions. Aftermath Pompey fled from Pharsalus to Egypt, where he was assassinated on the order of Pharaoh Ptolemy XIII. Ptolemy XIII sent Pompey's head to Caesar in an effort to win his favor, but instead secured him as a furious enemy. Ptolemy, advised by his regent, the eunuch Povinus, and his rhetoric tutor Theodotus of Chios, had failed to take into account that Caesar was granting amnesty to a great number of those of the senatorial faction in the defeat. Even men who had been bitter enemies were allowed not only to return to Rome but to assume their previous positions in Roman society. Pompey's assassination had deprived Caesar of his ultimate public relations moment, pardoning his most ardent rival. The Battle of Pharsalus ended the wars of the First Triumvirate. The Roman Civil War, however, was not ended. Pompey's two sons, Gnaeus Pompeius and Sextus Pompey, and the Pompeian faction, led now by Metellus Scipio and Cato, survived and fought for their cause in the name of Pompey the Great. Caesar spent the next few years mopping up remnants of the senatorial faction. After seemingly destroying all his enemies and bringing peace to Rome he was assassinated by friends in a conspiracy organized by Marcus Junius, Brutus and Gaius Cassius Longinus. Importance Paul K. Davis wrote that, Caesar's victory took him to the pinnacle of power, effectively ending the Republic. The battle itself did not end the civil war but it was decisive and gave Caesar a much-needed boost in legitimacy.
Until then much of the Roman world outside Italy supported Pompey and his allies due to the extensive list of clients he held in all corners of the Republic. After Pompey's defeat former allies began to align themselves with Caesar as some came to believe the gods favored him, while for others it was simple self-preservation. The ancients took great stock in success as a sign of favoritism by the gods. This is especially true of success in the face of almost certain defeat, as Caesar experienced at Pharsalus. This allowed Caesar to parlay this single victory into a huge network of willing clients to better secure his hold over power and force the Optimates into near exile in search for allies to continue the fight against Caesar. In popular culture, the battle gives its name to the following artistic, geographical, and business concerns. Pharsalia, a poem by Lucan. Pharsalia, New York, U.S. Pharsalia Technologies, Inc.